welcome. Okay, so um, welcome to everyone. We in the middle of the experience of revelation at Har Sinai. So if you notice, my background is kind of these low lying rocky mountains of some desert environment. And um, it is uh, reminiscent of the whole story of Har Sinai and how we received the Torah on Har Sinai. And little children learn uh, when they in Cheda, they learn how all the mountains were arguing with each other. Who's going to be the mountain that's going to have the merit of having Torah given or revealed on its height? And the little children learn that um, the big mountains were saying, we so big and grand, you know, Torah should be revealed to us. And then the valleys were um, saying, we so humble, should give it to us. And then Mount Sinai was chosen, which was a very kind of humble mountain, not so high, but high enough because it's good to be humble, but you still have to have some self-esteem. So I thought that this background was quite fitting. Um, about a year ago, I was in Sedona and there's a lot of mountains that are very much kind of rocky and you feel like you're out in the expanse of um, kind of, I don't know, it felt a little bit like this environment. And I had that little bit of Har Sinai experience as well as the fact that People say in Sedona that a lot of the mountains, um, they have, uh, what's the word? Um, not frequencies, but um, there's, there's elevation? a- Elevation? Um, elevation? No, not elevation. Um, there's places where, um, I've forgotten the word, uh, where there's a very, high vibrational frequency and people kind of feel like they can have extra sensory um experiences Brittany, i didn't mean to um to 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 mute you so if you feel like you want to unmute yourself just go ahead um there's um there's something about the mountains of sedona where around the world there's certain places like much of what's there's um it's, it's an electrical force of some sort because when I was in Sedona, friends of mine put a camera down on the grounds and it drained her battery like wow. instantaneously. Right. I've forgotten what the word is, but people can have these like experiences of downloads in some way. There's a word. I'm going to remember what it what it is. I, I just... can't remember either, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> So I, I was on the mountains and I was at one of those places and I was like, you know, trying to tune in. So it's very reminiscent of the um, Moshe and Har Sinai experience. So um, last week we were talking about Parshas Yitro and we spent a lot of time talking about the persona of Moshe's father-in-law, uh, whose name was Yitro. And we said that in, in his merit, the Torah was given because the revelation of Torah and the acceptance of God and the perception of God had to reach beyond the Jewish people, had to kind of penetrate to even the lowest levels and Yitro who had been involved in every single Avodazora, idol worship. Um, even he saw and accepted God and in a way that was like Torah penetrating to all corners of the universe. And that was in a way a prerequisite for receiving the Torah. But we didn't speak so much about the experience of the revelation of Torah. And it's interesting because in this week's Parsha, when we've already received the Torah, um, the narrative starts discussing different laws that are mentioned in the Torah, and then it flips back. And in case you felt that you missed out on the full drama of receiving the Torah, it's actually included in in this week's Pasha. So we're gonna to get to that in a, in a little bit. Just to um, talk uh, or start off with the Hayom Yom. 
there's a lot of different Hayom Yoms that we could pick for today. But the one that kind of jumped out at me from this week's readings or choices is the one from Monday, the Hayom Yom from Monday, which is about love. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, when people talk about love, the energy of love, in 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 other religions, in one particular religion, you know, it's very um, common and frequently quoted. God is love, <laughs> or even in terms of healing and New Age, there's a lot of talk about this energy of love and the power of this energy of love. So there's Yakova. So I'm not sure um, why she couldn't get on before, but uh, now she is here. So, um, so it's good. So, uh, yes. Uh, when you get a chance, could you send around another link to getting to buying the tickets? Yes, I sent them on today, but I'll I'll do it right after. Anyway, okay. So in the so in the Hayom Yom for today, which is just to repeat, it's the previous Rebbe, not Menachem Mendel, but his father-in-law, who wrote all these little Hasidic teachings and then Menachem Mendel, the most recent Lubavitcher Rebbe, he put it together and assigned a teaching to every day of the calendar year. So the one that he assigned for the Monday of this past week is, love is the spirit of life in the service of Hasidus. So in case you thought that this was not a Jewish idea, here it is. Love is the spirit of life in the service of Hasidus. It is the lifeline that binds Hasidim to each other, that binds the Rebbe to the Hasidim and the Hasidim to the Rebbe. It functions both as a direct light and a rebounding light. It knows no barriers and transcends the bounds of space and time. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is that Susan knows I love talking about vibes and I love talking about energy. And really, we talk about vahafta larecha kamocha that we should love another as ourselves. But what is this energy of love? This is a energy of opening our heart and allowing an energetic connection to flow between us and other people. So it's talking about that connection of Hasidim or really it's that we should love every Jew as ourselves or love your neighbor as yourself. It's really um, an energy of expansion as opposed to an energy of contraction. So we're supposed to not only love other people, we're literally supposed to be in love with Hashem, supposed to be, and I don't like the word supposed to be, we invited to be or we, it would be good if we can awaken within ourselves the capacity to be in love with all of creation, every every bit of grass, every flower, every tree, because the <coughs> Shem is the indwelling aspect of Hashem is in all of creation, in all of nature. Hashem is certainly in all people, the Shekhinah aspect of Hashem, we have Hashem the creator, then we have Hashem the indwelling aspect of God. So where does it dwell in? It dwells in us and it dwells in creation. And when we appreciate and relate to and look at and appreciate creation, we're appreciating um, Hashem and, and his investing his life force in everything. But then this idea of love between people and love between us and our teachers or us also specifically the Rebbe um, is this aspect of connecting to a life force, connecting to an energy, connecting and plugging in. So I just thought that that was something interesting to just throw out there that was the the learning from um from monday there is a learning that we can come to a little bit later um and we can flip back and talk about it so 
if we come into if we come into the parsha and let's actually a question is the word is the word vortex vortex thank you it is i don't know it popped up to me when you were talking about yes hayom yom and you were talking about energy i yes. was wondering if the word is vortex yes it is vortex and so it's interesting if we think wow. of our Sinai as a mountain on top of which was a super vortex, right? Not just a regular old vortex, but like a super duper vortex. So um, we start off um, with the Torah reading of Mishpatim. And just before we go, I'll just stop here for a minute. I mean, another question? Bob. Hmm? No. No other question. Okay. So if somebody is not muted and there's somebody talking in your space, we can all hear. So is it You're doing it into my eye. But somebody's definitely not muted. I'm going to have to mute everyone if it doesn't uh, shut shut off. So I hope I don't have to do that. Oh, still muting. I'm going to. We're not muted. I'm I've been in for two days. Okay, I'm muting everyone because somebody I, I heard a lot of noise, so I'm sorry. So, um, okay, so Mishpatim is now going to be. Um, it starts off, and it's going to be all the kind of rules that if you were designing how to run a society with sensible rules you would come up with these. They're not metaphysical. They're not extraordinary. They're just good civil common sense laws. But Hashem wants you to know that these laws are given by Hashem and they're given at Har Sinai. Now, they're going to be laws and it's going to be confusing to look inside this part um, oh, I left my notebook at home. Uh, oh, it's not at home. I am at home. I was going to say in the kitchen, but I have them here. I'm just going to give you a quick summary because I it's a lot to go through the text. But basically, we're going to talk about how one takes care of a slave. A slave was somebody perhaps who stole money and didn't have the money to give it back or sold themselves into slavery to a Jewish slave, Jewish slave to pay off the debt. Right. There's um, different kinds of uh, slaves. If the, um, when we think of the word slave, we, we have different connotations, but in, in um, Jewish law, there was no prisons. If a person um, couldn't pay a debt, they would put themselves in slavery. There were different um, circumstances that a person could become a slave, a male and a female. So it starts off with talking about how to take how one deals with one slave. If a slave is so comfortable living in your house and he doesn't want to leave when he's supposed to be set free, what do you do with him? Um, a lot of rules about if you strike somebody and you cause them to to die if you meant it or you didn't mean it, what would happen to them? We know that if you didn't mean a person to be killed, it was an accidental killing, then the person who's guilty of that or who caused that to happen can go to a, a city of refuge. The laws about you shouldn't strike or curse your father and mother, you shouldn't kidnap anyone, which Definitely should tell those to some people. Shouldn't curse your father or mother. If you curse, cause an injury to somebody, watch uh, how does that happen. If you have a servant in your possession or you they're working for you as a servant and you cause them injury, the kind of liabilities that there are injury to a pregnant woman. If you cause someone to lose an eye or a leg or a hand, how you have to pay when it says an eye for an eye, it means the value of that eye in the commercial marketplace. It doesn't mean you you know, you know have to give your eye, it means the value of an eye. When we say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Um, payment, if, if your animal 
gores or damages somebody else's property, if somebody falls into a hole on your property, if your ox attacks another ox, if 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 um if someone steals another ox, if a thief is breaking into your apartment and you hurt him or you kill him, what are those liabilities? And I'm not going to give you the answers of all, you know, the instant, you know, this is what happens. But these are the kind of things that are um, discussed if a fire spreads and it causes damage. Um, if you ask someone to take care of your property and something happens to it while they get taking care of it, who's liable? If a girl gets seduced, then the man really is expected to marry her. Things like that, not to worship uh, idols, not to um, not to be involved in sorcery, and that's all. The first section, the second section, and I'm just going to kind of skip over that, and let's go into the third section because that's when um, I kind of want to start focusing in, and let's go to verse twenty because. The third, um, the third reading, and here it is. And I think this is very interesting. How many times the Torah focuses on these, this particular idea and the next idea. So if somebody wants to read verse 20 and verse 21 in English or in Hebrew, I, I don't mind. I see Linda put on her glasses. I see Sandra's looking. Where it says, and you shall not mistreat a stranger. Yeah. Nor shall you oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So you shall not oppress any widow or orphan. Right. So that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, read one more. Read one more. If you oppress him, beware. For if he cries out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And then the next one. My wrath will be kindled, and I will slay you with the sword. And your wives will be widowed, and your children orphans. I mean, that's pretty heavy duty, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I want you to really know that you need to have compassion. You need to have, I'm going to bring the Rashis in because some of them are interesting. Um, you need to have compassion because, and it keeps saying over and over again, it doesn't say because you were slaves in Egypt, you should have a slave and a victim mentality for the rest of your lives for the next 65 generations and never get over that you were slaves in Egypt. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say because you were slaves in 25 generations, you should ask the Mitzrim for what, what's a compensation, re reparations. It doesn't say that. What it does say, because you know that it's been brought up in, in Congress in America that the American tax <laughs> now should be paying reparations to the black community for slavery that was over 250 years ago. The, that mm -hmm. is discussed in Congress. It doesn't say that. What it does say is because you were slaves in Egypt, you need to have extra compassion. That's what it says. You do need to have extra compassion because you were foreigners because you are foreigners and um, you can't, and, and Rashi says, you can't talk with words. You can't even, you know, say mean things. And certainly you shouldn't try and get him out of his money because he doesn't know the rules of the land. And then Rashi says, because you were strangers. And if you accuse someone else of saying, well, you just, you know, an immigrant or whatever, don't say that because you too, um, every expression of a stranger, ger, means a person who was not born in that country, but has come from another country to sojourn there. And I think this is very interesting that the Torah is very, very explicit. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. Don't taunt anyone else. Because remember, when you first came down to Egypt, of course, we know they later oppressed us, but initially they they did take us in. We were strangers over there. And then it says, uh, does somebody want to read this verse 21, the Rashi on verse 21? I'll 
I'll do it. It's okay. If nobody wants okay. to. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you shall not oppress any widow or orphan. The same applies to all people, but the scriptures speak of the usual situation since they, widows and orphans, are weak and they are frequently oppressed. Okay, so Hashem is saying, I, I really want you to pay attention to those who are marginalized in the community, particularly, and for example, a widow or an orphan because they have less advocates. A widow doesn't have a husband. The orphan doesn't have his or her parents. So be extra careful about those. And then Hashem says this like really intense thing that if you do oppress them, if you do oppress them, I'm going to oppress you, midda connected midda. And um and then it says uh uh there is this concept of um, and it, and Rashi says it's an expression of a threat. If you oppress him, the orphan, you will ultimately receive what is coming to you because the orphan will cry out to Hashem and Hashem will hear that. And and that is not okay. Um, is that why there's a bigger reward or, or some version thereof? Like when you, you know, when you donate to a widow or to an orphan, like if something off of it happens, the 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 merit is a uh, very high definitely definitely that the idea is that we remember and take care of those that's why you know this is another thing and rashi talks about it it talks about giving tithes it talks about not murdering it talks about the idea of of um ways that you can earn forgiveness for your misdeeds, even if it means, you know, serving someone else from whom you stole from. So Rashi actually, and it actually starts off and it says that you could think that these things are common sense. You could think that these things exist amongst the nations just because these are the rules that make a civil society. But Rashi actually tells us that these are the rules that make a civil society because they were revealed on Har Sinai and they've become embedded in the consciousness of people worldwide. But really, these ideas come from Torah. They come from the Jew, the Judo Christo, mm -hmm. how do you say, the Jew, Jewish Judean, Judean. Um, uh, Judo Christian, what, what and values? Yeah, Judeo values. Christian values, right? Yeah. And that they were, Judeo they were before they were Christian. They were revealed on. They were revealed at Torah, and they've become part of civil society's, you know, value system. But really, they, they, it is because it was revealed in in Har Sinai. So Rashi says. Laws recorded in the Torah that if they had not been given would have been appropriate to institute them in any in any case. But um, that's why when it's it starts off that these are from Sinai. But know that it's because they're from Sinai that they known in the community. Susan, you'll have to unmute yourself because there was noise and I muted everyone. Hi. Yeah. Uh, it came up for me. I'd like to share. Sure. And that, um, this idea about orphans and widows and how widows are treated so um, welcomingly. People invite them for Shabbos. They care. They, they feel a certain empathy. And I have put out into my community, what is it like for someone who's divorced? Like, how does, how come that is not recognize that people don't equate mm -hmm. widows and divorcees it's true but i i am baruch hashem have a very beautiful relationship with my neighbors and i i generally don't feel that but i see it and experience it and know others do that why our community isn't mm -hmm. the same way matter of fact one friend put it is you know oh um the neighbor down the hall is a widow and she gets all these invitations and everyone just just cuts you off when you're divorced so it's, I, true. You're, it's like 
you know, there's a, Lorena Lynn actually wrote a song that's called Rated X based on that. Who wrote a song? Concept. Huh? Who wrote a song? Loretta Lynn, and it talks about divorce and how people are treated as divorce. Really? Yeah, and it's called Rated X. And and oh. it's like, if you do this, you're not good. People don't talk to, I mean, it's in this song and it's it's it actually makes sense. And I know, and, and I, I'm sorry, Susan, I interrupted. Go continue, I'm sorry. No, I'm a friend of mine <clears throat> I've encouraged to write an article like from Ashfaq Arami about this topic. That's it. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I think that <laughs> making a very good point. And I think that in the context of our Parsha, um, people who are widows are people who divorced really should be accorded the same kind of consideration mm -hmm. as the people who are widows. Um, they don't understand how hard it is at times when you had to try to find a place for the holidays because you didn't have, you know, like or if your parents weren't here or whatever, you had to try to find a place and you kind of felt like you were at times begging. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, more, it was hurtful. I mean, it was really almost embarrassing time. I mean, one year I got, I got disinvited for, to some, from something. I'm like, what, you know, and, and, and I mean, it, things worked out, but I always said after that, when I, God willing, when I get married again and have my house, it's never going to happen. And and I really made it my business to always have, you know, even when I had the Ucky kitchen and it wasn't done, it doesn't matter. Just come, we'll, we'll figure it out. And I just can't do that to be, it's just, it, it killed. It was, I was, it was hard. So I think that you're all making a good point. Your co I'm going to come to you now. I see your hand is raised. I think that, um, the implication of the, the mitzvah is marginalized people. I think that in our times, we can generously extend it to divorced woman, not yet married woman. You know, there's the same thing, people who, you know, there's the regular, <clears throat> the regular situation of people who are married, thank God, have children, thank mm -hmm. God. And then there's many other people who don't fit into that. And, it's not specifically mentioned in the Parsha and the divorced woman and the not yet married woman and the woman who don't have children and et cetera, et cetera. But I think that the extension of this kind of sensitivity that is being raised by the Sukkim should apply to us for us to take it upon ourselves that it includes all of those people who are not included in the, you know, husband, children, dog, or whatever nice house, <laughs> but, you know, situation. But I think you're raising a good point. You're cover. What, what would you like to say on this? No, I was going to say, I was really going to say just the fact that there's a specific mitzvah and it's not just for widows, it's for orphans mm -hmm. as well. And Judaism de defines orphans as having lost only one parent, not, I mean, when I was growing up, an orphan was somebody like little orphan Annie, they lost both their parents. Uh, so it's a, it, because there's a specific mitzvah and because people want to do the 613 mitzvahs, I think that there's a, a tendency to forget. And, and also I read a book, not, I didn't read a book. I'm sorry. I read an, I read an article or something about a book in the Jewish world about how to have a good marriage. And it's, I can tell you who it's written by, but I don't think I, I should do that at this point, but, but they had a certain list of hints for couples. And one of them was to not socialize with people in their age group. Like especially other couples or singles in the of, of the opposite sex. Well, I mean, a couple is two. Uh, both sexes are represented in most couples. Uh, so. you're, you're talking about couples shouldn't mix with yeah, other because it's about how to preserve a marriage. They're saying how to preserve a a new marriage, I guess. And oh, and okay. Person actually said that they should not socialize with like with people of their age group because it would invite comparisons. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to this person and I said, you know, that is great if you live in a world where all new married couples have family to go to. Mm -hmm. But um, what about widows? What about divorced people? What about people who are not yet married? And I know, of course, I never heard back from this person. Of course was, not. Mm -hmm. So um, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I didn't mean to go off the onto a tangent, but. Well, yeah. I, I I think that it's incumbent upon us to take that specific, those two specific mitzvot and to apply them to 
you know, whenever we can to have in mind that the people in the community that need to be included mm -hmm. aren't as buttressed against society as other people. So I think that is something to bear in mind that it's not just the widows or just the orphans. Mm -hmm. so, um, Beautifully said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So I want to go on. And um, the next piece is going to be something that actually is echoed in the Hayom Yom. I remember I said that I want to come back to a Hayom Yom in a little moment um, while we're doing the Pasha. So it's in the fourth in the fourth um, one, and it's verse five here. Now, if some, because this, in the Hayom Yom, we've got a beautiful Hasidic extrapolation on this verse. Does somebody read, want to read verse five? Liz, do you feel like reading it? Verse five in the, of chapter 23, you can read it in English if you want. Verse five of chapter 23. But you muted, I think. So we need you to unmute. You have to unmute. Uh, you still have to unmute. You're still muted. <laughs> ah, we, if you can believe it, I'm on a phone, so I really um, can't see. Uh, okay. Am I doing you can, chapter 23, number yeah, you one? Could, where it's you could look it in your own Chumash, chapter 23, uh, verse 5. Okay, it says, you shall not, no, you shall not you accept the false... Mm, chapter 23 verse 5 if you see oh okay oh okay i see it now if you see your enemy's donkey lying under that's it it's burden would mm. you refrain from helping him you shall surely help him along with right. him right so this is a very interesting and curious mitzvah if you see the enemy, your enemy's donkey, struggling with its burden, and the, the Torah kind of asks the question, would you, would you not help him? Of course, you would for sure help him. It's your enemy's donkey, but you shouldn't, out, because you have animosity to the donkey's owner, mm -hmm. you shouldn't not help relieve the burden on that poor donkey. It's actually a mitzvah in the Torah. Let's see what Rashi says. Does Rashi say anything about it? Um, uh, it doesn't say. It's just Rashi just says it's a it's a um, it's a rhetorical question. Okay, so I'm going to go to the Hayom Yom because the Hayom Yom gives a beautiful Hasidic uh, extrapolation on this mitzvah from a kind of a mystical point of view. So I just want to share this with you because it's, um, first of all, whenever we learn Hayom Yom, we're getting a little bit of, of Hasidus, as Susan reminded me. And um, we get a, another level of interpretation. So the Baal Shem Tov teaches, when you see the donkey, that is when you carefully inspect your chomer, because a donkey in Hebrew is a is a chamor. Donkey in Hebrew chamor. Oh. Your physicality is your chomer, your density, your substance. In other words, your physical body. The Baal Shem Tov says, "One who hates you." Um one who hates you, in other words, your enemy, It uh, this is this aspect of materiality, for it hates the soul that longs for godliness and spirituality. Furthermore, you will see that it is lying under its burden. So the physicality of you is struggling to, like, the physicality of you is burdening the spirituality of you, so to speak. Your your soul is kind of struggling under the burden of its of its donkiness, of its materiality. It's lying under its burden. Hashem intended that the body be refined by studying Torah and observing mitzvahs, but it's not really fulfilling its task. In other words, the soul is supposed to not 
be struggling so much under the burden of the materiality, but it's struggling under this burden of materiality. You might think that you should refrain from helping him, refrain from helping him in his mission. And you might think that you should kind of hurt the body or deprive the body or um, mortify the body or you know, cause your body suffering because it's not, it's it's burdening your soul's path. You understand, everybody with me? So you might mm -hmm. think that you shouldn't help the donkey. You you shouldn't help it, and you should maybe allow it to, you know, just be a burden and and then burden it even more. The Baal Shem Tov says, however, this will not cause the light of the Torah to dwell within you. Instead, you should certainly help him, certainly help the donkey. <laughs> How would you help the donkey? By refining and purifying your body rather than breaking it through self-affliction. Okay. What does that mean? Can anyone help me to explain the Baal Shem Tov? So I'll just say it again. Mm -hmm. the, the, the body is burdened the soul, I'm sorry, the soul is burdened by its donkiness, its physicality. And the physicality is feeling like a burden to the soul because the soul wants to soar and the soul wants to fly. And there that burden of the homer, which is a metaphor or not a metaphor, but it's the same word as the donkey. You might think that you should kind of afflict the donkey or, 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 or be mean to the donkey because you know, it's, it's, it's an enemy of yours, right? You might think that and you would refrain from helping the donkey. You could even think you should afflict your body. But the Baal Shem Tov says, no, you should surely help him. What does that mean? By helping the donkey, um, or basically you're in turn helping the person I think it go. You don't become. You're you're not enemies because you're not allowed to have enemies. So it brings you. You know, you might spark the forgiveness. And I remember Reverend Sin Young writes. I think said that when I used to go to Hineni. So because you went and helped, now you're going to be speaking to the person, and you know maybe the anger will you know dissipate. What's the word? You know what I mean. And um and then because you can't have enemies, so hence. Oh, Okay, well, you gave me a very good explanation of why if you see your enemy's donkey struggling and you go and you help, maybe your enemy won't be your enemy anymore because you helped him with his donkey and you did a good thing and you helped out someone who you considered an enemy and now you did a good deed. But you didn't help me explain the metaphor. Oh, sorry, the <laughs> can I get a shot? Yeah. Here you go, Susan, you help. Yeah. Who was it? No, who was Karen? Go. It was who? Helena was you? I had, please, I had my hands up too, but I don't know who else. Please, did. Please, oh, no, who? Yeah. Okay, let's go for Helene. So the idea of helping the body yeah. versus afflicting the body. Yes. I'm looking at in two ways the body as your physical body. Yes. Also, perhaps your body as your animalistic tendencies. Yes. And both are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're, they're conduits. Yes. Into, and they're there yes. in order for us to, 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 to complete our purpose. Yes. So if we burden it and attack it, that's only going to bring us further away because the whole reason why we have it is to use these challenges that come up and for our, our godly soul to then support and take that energy and elevate it. Perfect answer. 10 out of 10 cookies. <laughs> Thank you. Stars. <laughs> all the accolades that you can get exactly. So in other words, the Baal Shem Tov is saying 
that your donkey, your materiality cannot be a burden to your service of God. You have to channel that donkey. You have to ride the donkey. You have to make the donkey serve you, not by afflicting it, not by letting it suffer under a burden, not by saying, I'm, I'm going to, you know, um, I'm going to starve myself. I'm going to afflict myself. I'm going to break my body. And therefore, that, that is not the path of the Baal Shem Tov. I'll, I'll read it to you in the notes. And it's exactly what Helene said, but I'll read it inside. Hashem created the world so that he would have a dwelling place among human beings, mortals, not angels, so that the material plane should not be perceived as something opposed to the spiritual plane, but as something to be permeated by the spiritual plane. In this vein, our sages describe the verse, know God in all your ways, right? As a little passage on which all the fundamentals of the Torah depend. God's got to be part of everything. You're eating, you're breathing, the way you take care of your body. Hashem is, all, is there too. For the purpose of our entire Torah observant is to infuse all our worldly activities with godliness. Don't afflict the body, use the body to serve Hashem. So I just wanted to uh, welcome Devorah because she came late and I see she's here somewhere. Um, so I'm glad that you're here, Devorah. So welcome. So, and also welcome to Sandy, who I didn't welcome before. Oh, she's on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Sandy's here. So welcome. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's the idea that, that Thank you. we need to use the body and how do we use the body if we have a healthy body, if we feed the body, then we have energy to do mitzvot. If we don't get overly preoccupied by the body, it's like a car. You can buy a car, mm -hmm. you can get all involved in the car and you think about the car and you get the best car in the market and you're polishing it and you're doing all kinds of things to it and you get distracted by the car. We don't want you to do that want you to buy a good solid car take care of it put oil in put oil in in the gas you know oil in, not, oil in the Change engine the oil <laughs> and, and, and give it the gas that it needs and and take care of it and you can even get joy of it but use that car to help you do mitzvahs to go visit people give rides to people use your body use your gashmis use your worldly possessions to serve Hashem. So it's not a oppositional thing. It's a cooperative thing. Susan has a question. Well, I was like, Helene came up with this right on answer. I think it was awesome. Lee said, I, you know, we believe in Kedushim and like ideas and speaking to her. Something else came to mind with this paragraph. If you don't mind me, give it a shot. Yeah, I don't mind at all. Please. So this, to me, the inspiration was the word, the letting the light in when you're talking about the light. I'm like very fixated on light these days. I don't know why. Yes. But um, and so I was reading this idea that when you're angry, there's there's no room for for light or joy. Right. So mm -hmm. um, this this ang when I think of an enemy, I think of anger and I think of um, resentment and it gets in your way. So don't let the enemy get in the way of your light. So holding a resentment or, or being fixated on being angry with your enemy and then, but, but to, you know, put it back to yourself and, and, and keep the light open. So it was just like a thought I had. Yeah. It's a good thought. It's a good thought. And it's always a good point. We don't want to, you know, what starting with how we started about the idea of love, love is a energy of connection and an expansive energy and anything that, starts constricting, constricting the connection between us and other chassidim or other yidden or other people, that's constrictive energy. And the more we connect to expansive energy within our own beings and bodies, the more there's, there's health benefits, there's light benefits. Um, so yes, but, and also in particular to this mitzvah here, it's the chomer. It's the physicality. It's the the 
the tangible aspect of life. We in this world for 120 years, we are not angels. We have opportunity that the Homer, you know, Homer could also be, I think, almost like cement. It's the, it's the stuff of the physical world that that has to be used to build reality. Okay, so we could stop there or we can do a little more because we're five to nine. But we didn't get to the revelation part. And the revelation part is kind of fun. So you want to go a little longer to the revelation part because um, I, I, we didn't get to it in yet. Mm -hmm. So who said no yeah. to revolution? Yeah, yeah who yeah. could say no to revolution? Yeah, really. Revelation. Oh, right. Okay, so we're going to have to go a little bit longer. So um, we're going to go all the way to the seventh to the seventh one and let's go um let me just see where it starts peric 24 let's go to peric 24 here okay so really this is funny because the torah is supposed to be well we we like to think that the torah is in chronological order but it's not so first of all, before Har Sinai, Hashem had already revealed to Moshe, before Har Sinai, when they camped at a place called Mara, Hashem had already revealed to Moshe what we call the seven mitzvot B'nai Noach. So they already had that. And then after they already said to the seven mitzvot B'nai Noach, the seven Noachide laws, then they're going to get more, and they're going to get more at Har Sinai. That's so, so interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting that... That they were given done, first, especially all, since it didn't apply to them because they were... Well, no, it applied because... The seven from, Noahide laws applies to everybody. Everybody, all mankind, except for the, the, three, myth, the three, whatever, Shabbos obviously doesn't apply. Right. But well, did they seven, have them already? The, Why seven, didn't... the seven Noahide laws, I'm not sure if they include Shabbos, but now when we come to our Sinai, we're going to add on. So when it says that they already had a covenant and Moshe read them the covenant and he read them a book, whatever, it's talking about the mitzvot that they had received before. So let's mm -hmm. read it inside and just see. I'm going to start here. So Moshe said, come to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you should all kind of stay a little bit distant. And Moshe alone will approach Hashem, but they shall not approach, and the people do not go up the mountain with, with him, with him. This is Moshe. So Moshe came and told the people all the words of, of the Lord and the ordinances, all the, all, all the ordinances. Moshe hasn't gone on Har Sinai yet. And the people had answered him in unison and they said, all the words that Hashem has spoken, we will do. So Rashi tells us that this is actually the stuff that had come before at Mara. And Moshe wrote all the words of the Lord and he arose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 monuments for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent the ewes of the Bnei Israel and they offered up burnt offerings and they slaughtered peace offerings to Hashem. And Moshe took blood and he put it into different basins and half the blood he cast on the altar. And he and, and then it says he took the book of the covenant. Hasn't gone up to Har Sinai yet. Very interesting. And he read it within the hearing of the people. And what did they say? Vayomru kol asher diber Hashem na'aseh v'nishma. We will do and we will, we will do and we will hear. And then he sprinkled this blood and then he says, and then they started ascending. And then this is very interesting. They perceived the God of Israel. And this is really a, a very, I shouldn't start talking to you about this five minutes before the end of the class. <laughs> but I, I, I wonder if I should bring the Rashi here. Let's see. We're up to here. Let's see. Um, here we go. Here we go. Uh, 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 here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And they perceived the God of Israel and beneath his feet was like the forming of a sapphire brick and like the appearance of the heavens for clarity. Is that a very interesting verse? Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed this verse before? I know that Karen and I have studied it before, but it's very interesting verse. It's not an e it's not an easy it's not an easy verse to understand. Is that why Lubavitchers see the luchos as cubes that go back and forth and and not the the shape that we see in uh, on statues and synagogues and things like that? Movie. <laughs> movies. First of all. This brick beneath the feet of, of, of Hashem, it's it's very esoteric. And and I I must just tell you, not only because it's nine o'clock already, but this is just like an appetizer to this concept because we're not going to really understand exactly what it's saying. But first of all, the idea that the tablets of the Ten Commandments were written on sapphire that we know. Why was it sapphire? We know that Moshe, first of all, he had the tablets and he dropped them, right? And then he had to gather rock, stone, and chisel some tablets and then go back up to Harsina and get them re-engraved by God. So it says that Moshe camp, his own, his own tent was on a um on a what do you call uh, when like not a mine, a quarry, a sapphire quarry. And so he took sapphire from near his tent. But here we have an image of sapphire up in Shemayim. God, this is a vision that the people had of God, of God sitting and by his feet was sapphire, sapphire brick. So I just want to tell you what, uh, what, um, what Rashi says. So this brick was before Hashem at the time of the bondage. And Hashem was, while they were in slaves, Hashem was holding this brick. He was feeling their, their, um, their pain in having to build and suffer with these bricks. And now, since they've been redeemed, this brick has sort of changed color. It's now light and joy. It's it's got this color of sapphire because it's changed. It's it's become clear and unclouded. Like during the bondage of the Israelites, the sapphire brick clouded the heavens, but after the Exodus, the heavens became clear and not a cloud was in sight. Maybe that's why we're in awe when we see a sky that has no clouds. <laughs> well, first of all, there's that. And I know Susan raised her hand, so I'm going to come to Susan in a minute. No. Oh, no, you didn't. Okay, Helen, you're, are these old hands? These are old hands from before? Okay. Uh, no, I raised my hand again. Oh, no. Okay, <laughs> so before I answer your question, I just want to tell you that I have, I'm friendly with a person who's, I guess she's quite psychic. She doesn't call herself a psychic, but she is psychic. She notices changes in the light. And she feels that since Mashiach is coming and, well, we know Mashiach is coming, but because whenever there's intense darkness, there's always more light that gets generated. And we've been through a period of intense mm -hmm. darkness. And through that intense darkness, there is more love, more unity, more connection, more compassion, and it's kind of generating its own light in the midst of the darkness. And she often says to me, are you noticing the light? Are you noticing the light, you know, in the air? Are you noticing the, the look of the sky, et cetera, et cetera? So here, even according to Rashi, there's this beautiful idea that while the Yidden were enslaved in Egypt, Hashem had so much compassion for them that some aspect of the heavens in the reality up above, it's, Rambam says it's sort of just, it's, it's a kind of a vision that existed that there's something that up above in the heavens was clouded and was dark, and it takes the shape of this brick because Hashem, you know, had compassion and empathy for the Yidden. And then now that they 
they've been redeemed and they've been you know led they they out of out of bondage there's this shift and this change and this brick that sits in front of Hashem almost like a symbol of the status of the world or the status of the Yidden has now gone and and is clear and it's um radiant and it has a light I, I don't know if we can say so much about that um I know uh Helene you wanted to say something about that I'm just thinking, you know, that the, the, the sapphire and sephirot, you know, from the same root right. and that perhaps it's the, you know, that, that God's compassion in redeeming us was giving us like this additional light to be able to use to refine the qualities within ourselves. So it was like an opportunity, but it's not it's not there yet because it's like, I don't know, I'm thinking because it's a, a, a shape of something, when I think of a brick, right? It just feels very like non-changing. Well, you're right that there is a connection between the idea of sapphire and sapir and spherot. They have the same letters. And the idea is that when we work on our midot, our characteristics, we refine our Aspects mm -hmm. like a precious stone can be refined. So there is all of that. Um, Susan, is that a hand or it's not a hand? No, no it's an old hand. Oh, it's an old hand. Okay, can so I, I just, just want to go, just want to go a little bit quickly. Sorry? Can I just say how wonderful it is that so many of us are on tonight? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's awesome. Very special. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to take Rashi away for a minute because I just want us to get this um, experience of revelation and then we'll try and um, kind of wrap up. So uh, mm -hmm. so they, so here it is. Um, and then um, and then Hashem said to Moshe, come to me, come up to the mountain and remain mm -hmm. here and I will give you the stone tablets the law and the commandments which I've written to instruct them. And Moshe and Yeshua, his servant, went up and Moshe ascended to the mount of, to, he, he, ascend, he ascended up there. And it says, and, the el and to the elders, he said, wait for us here. And until we return to you, Aaron and Hur, that's Miriam's son, if there's any trouble, anyone needs a, 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 a judgment, they'll take care of it. And then it says, Moshe went up to the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of Hashem rested on Har Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And he called to Moshe on the seventh day from within the cloud. And the appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire atop the mountain before the eyes of Bnei Israel. And Moshe came within the cloud and he went up to the mountain and Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And I took away the Rashi, but just the idea of the 40 days and the 40 nights is that basically Moshe, the way that a fetus is in the, in the womb for 40 days and uh, for 40 weeks, Moshe becomes like a, a different being in order to exist on the mountain he had to and i've spoken about this before and we could talk about it again he had to kind of divest himself of his physicality and almost become like a spiritual entity he had to kind of be reborn almost like a malach almost into a different construct a uh, different creation so that he could communicate with hashem like to like he had to kind of form mm -hmm. kind of lose his physicality in a way and then when he came back he had to sort of re re-inhabit his physicality and i i had a question once of why couldn't moshe just come back earlier and then we could have avoided mm -hmm. that whole golden calf thing but there was this process of divesting himself of his physicality and then he had to reinvest himself re inhabit his physicality in it and it was a process and it, it took a certain amount of time and he even when he came down it said his face was shining and he was radiating light 
So it's similar if anybody watches near death experiences, you know, and people kind of divest themselves of their being, of their physicality. Moshe had this experience of leaving his physicality behind and being able to function in a non physical way and then coming down and then reintegrating into his physicality. So there's more to say about that, but I think for now we'll, we'll leave that. Um, but this consuming fire atop the mountain, this is, this is sort of it of Moshe disappearing and the people seeing the fire and experiencing. And there were a lot of rules about who was allowed to, um, who was allowed to ascend and who's not allowed to ascend. And it was very guarded that anybody who shouldn't ascend, it was very structured, who could go further, 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 and only Moshe really could go all the way. We'll talk about it more because it's not over, but um, I think for today, uh, that's probably enough anybody can absorb. Um, but if there are any questions or comments, uh, you know, and we've been on already for long. So if you need to go, don't feel bad. But if there's any questions or comments, uh, I'd love to hear them. I have a quick question. Sure. I have to raise my hand. <clears throat> no, just um, just that before this all happened, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was talking about that there was a that Moshe was holding onto a book of things. Yes, yeah, some. That was, was the book that he had written from the seven Noahide laws that had been given. And that oh, was the yeah. book that he was reading to, some kind of scroll or something. And then when he went to Har Sinai, he got the rest of them. He got that was like the cliff notes, and then he got uh -huh. the, the long lecture adding on to that when he went to Har Sinai. He got that. It was very interesting. Not that I think I know everything, but I never. It's never been brought out like this important thing that the seven Noahid wars were were brought out first. Yes, it is very interesting. Very interesting. And I don't think I knew it before. I think I heard it the first time last year when I learned it. I was like, hmm, I didn't know that before. So right. it, it would make sense <laughs> because remember they weren't like you know at uh, Adam Chava uh, the generations they weren't Jewish. Well, and they, so they weren't the Noahid. They weren't even Noahides. Right. right, but I guess from Noah they became Noahides, but they had to have some set of laws, right, to govern society anyway. Exactly. So, so it's an ascending. First you get the Noahide laws, and then it's like the next level is the the mitzvot on Har Sinai. Mm -hmm. An ascending. They needed to get the the, the first seven, and then it's like a adding on. Yeah. Very Thank attentive, you. and I love all the participation and all the involvement. So that's very, I, I value it and I appreciate it. And have you ever met a Noahide? Sorry, have I ever met a Noahide? Well, there are people who get disillusioned with Christianity, but they mm -hmm. don't convert. And there is a whole movement of mitzvah, seven mitzvot of Noah observant communities. Mm -hmm. and in the south, very, right? yeah, in the very south. about it they don't want to convert and become jews but they don't believe the the mm -hmm. christian stuff either and there is a big community of noahides mm -hmm. right i was also taught very early on when i connected with chabad that that we should teach the noahide laws mm -hmm. to everyone so not just like a noahide community but that these right. are the laws mm -hmm. of just being a human being right. you know like not eating a a, a a limb off of a live animal right. you know it's, it, yeah there's and right. that it's it's not really like a religion it's it's, it's just a way to be a moral human being right for example don't commit adultery that's a good mm -hmm. one that would yeah, be pretty much for everybody yes yeah and set up a court system that mm -hmm. also makes sense like right so you should have right i think yeah there's a court system there's um right the, the live an, a limb from a live animal and a lot of the laws that you were saying like with um 
uh, either if you kill somebody or it's an accident or is this it's there's so many different degrees like in in society of you know like if it was murder was it attempted murder was it manslaughter was it it's all right. it's amazing that it's all in there you right. know i mean it was just it, it just blew me you know like what we're living today is there and right <sighs> right right so we're very grateful that Hashem gave us the Torah and he gave us the Noahide laws and um just teaching yeah this this week's part is just teaching about being a decent human being the interesting thing is that it starts off with how you should treat a slave a Jewish mm -hmm. slave I don't I don't know if everybody knows the details but it's like you have to give him your bed instead of your own like you have to sort of treat him like a an equal and not an equal maybe even a right, I know what you mean which right. is a very interesting thing like because you wouldn't think of a slave like that but right but right. that's like can't that's in other words do what they did <laughs> right i was just looking nice this, thing this, yeah so the seven noahide laws civil justice against blaspheming god no worship of idols no immorality no murder no theft and no eating a limb from a living animal mm -hmm. those were the seven but I don't think they have any holidays. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, they're kind of like bummed out on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, they we can... actually met a couple there, like real Noahides. Um, remember at my when I lived in New Jersey, she had the the rabbits and had two people that were that were were Noahides and um, like actual you know from from Shem. You know, like we were able to trace their lineage back to, which was really yeah. just an amazing. You know, it was really interesting. Right. So you met so you met these Noahide people? There are no real Noahide people. There really are. No, 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 no. I know there are. I just I wasn't sure if you said that they well, were. Well, yeah, we met them. They they spoke about being Noahides, you know, and how they how it came. And um, you know, and if you also know the story of Indiana Jones, there's a re he really it's based on a real person. Oh. oh. Named Vendel Jones. And Vendel Jones is he's he's a Noahide. I think that might have just been yeah. made that way because he actually um, has children and grandchildren. Then they, well, his children converted to Judaism and they're learning in yeshiva. Now he, I don't even know if he's alive anymore. But so the whole story, though, is based on this real person. And he was, because he wasn't Jewish, he was able to look for the ark. And also he feels that be that he didn't convert for the reason that this he can feels like he can reach out to more people and and could have spread, you know, God's word. And and yeah, so if you ever look him up, there really it really is this whole story. And and he became a Noahide and um, you know, was able to connect a lot and just awesome. an amazing thing. Okay, ladies, I'm gonna um <laughs> do a close. If you can get to my concert, I'm really, you know. Yeah, I'm going to try to get some other people. All you could come for the weekend. And um, uh, anyone else who wants to come in, we can make arrangements for you. Mm -hmm. we'll what, where, what, when? I, don't, I didn't know about this. So I'm having a concert this coming Sunday night. Helene, where do you live? Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, it's a little... oh that could be a little different. No, where do you live? <laughs> Uh, Rockland County. Ah, okay. Harry, New Hampstead. Anyway, I'm having a concert this Sunday night and I'm trying to get as many people to come and I'm pulling out all my punches. Guilt, bribery, you know. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Maybe uh, you live I, in Atlanta. My yes. brother used to live there, so I've gone I've gone several times. Uh, he lived in Sandy Springs. I live in Sandy Springs. Well, you know, you <laughs> Are you on the WhatsApp chat, Helene? Because you should have seen me posting about it. Maybe I did. I'm probably not on the WhatsApp. Would you oh. like to add me? Yeah, I need to add you. Let me. I'm just going to add you, Liz. Um, do you have Helene's WhatsApp address? Can you just forward it to me? Because you're on WhatsApp, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm on WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. So just forward it to me, and I'm going to add you, Helene. Okay. And okay. I'll I'll say good night to everyone. Good night, everybody. I wish you much success. May you get many, many, many people. Yeah, I'm going to try. Thank you. Thank you. More people for me, the more money for the soldiers. That's exactly. exactly. Yes, that's a that, wonderful that should thing. should be reason enough. So. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's fun. Fun. Thank you. Have a wonderful you, night. Have a great night. Everybody, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom.